modeling bond, attractive, and repulsive systems with potentials. Let's start off with the language problem. When one claims an atom is stable or unstable this statement is only about the state of the nucleus. Electrons live forever. Atoms live forever from hydrogen to lead. So anything beyond lead is unstable. That is here is that if the nucleus is stable, then the atom is stable. It's only about the nucleus. If the nucleus is unstable, then the atom is unstable. And so when we talk about an unstable nucleus, that's when the word radioactive comes into play. So what do we mean by the word radioactive? So in a nutshell, a radioactive nuclei occurs since the system is unbalanced. And what I'm really saying this, if the nucleus has an excess amount, of internal energy and in quantum physics we call these some type of an excited state then a radioactive decay occurs. Now, this is not a course in nuclear physics, but in its simplest form, the instability of an atomic nuclei, the majority of the time, is due to either an excess of either neutrons. So if you have too many neutrons, then it undergoes something called beta decay. If you have too many protons, it goes through a process called anti-beta decay. When these decays occur, the unstable nuclei moves towards stability. And what I mean by stability, it's moving towards a good ratio of neutrons and protons. Technically, that's when the nuclei are the happiest, when they reach what is called the line of stability. 
Google line of stability if you think this is interesting. The topic is absolutely beautiful. So the question is, why do we even want to study the nucleus? Because it's going to help us understand about electrical interactions. So that's the reason why. And what we're going to find here is that by studying the nucleus, we will learn more about electrical interactions, which is our goal. Our model or the model that we're going to use of the nucleus is going to be shallow. It's going to be oversimplified. But the main features will still be present. In the nucleus, there are two competing interactions. It's the attractive, strong versus the repulsive electrical forces. That's what we want to focus on. So let's get to that. So the first thing that we're going to find here is that it has been very well experimentally verified that the attractive strong force is much stronger than the powerful electrical repulsion. Maybe I should write this down. It is experimentally verified that the attractive strong force is much stronger than the powerful electrical repulsion. In other words, F strong is much stronger than the electrical. If that's truly the case, why are there radioactive nuclei? Why aren't all atoms stable? Anything past lead is technically radioactive. So to grasp where we're going, we need a couple of ideas that we have to 
to be able to understand this. And so here's sort of like our outline of what we're going to do over the next couple of chap lectures. The first thing is that we need to talk about what is this critical distance? And when I call this critical distance, I'll just write it D critical for strong interactions. Now, as situations get more complicated, we need a language change from forces to potential functions. It's not potential energy. Okay, that's, we're going to have to, we're going to have to, I'll explain when I get there, but it's not potential energy. And then what we have to do here is that we have to model um, behaviors using potentials. And what we're mainly looking at is that what's a good model for the atom? What's a good model for the nucleus? Those are really important. And then finally, we would then want to talk about the strong potential and the role of uranium. So I'm going to go through this list over the next you know, short lectures to try to grasp where we're headed for. So the first thing that we want to do is that we want to talk about critical I should have said the critical distance. Or strong interactions. The critical distance or strong interactions to occur is D critical, and this is about two Fermi's, and that is two times 10 to the minus 15 meters, a very, very tiny distance. So this is how this, this plays in here. So let's break down, break this into three cases. The first case that we want to look at is that if a nucleon is shot at a nucleus and passes farther than D critical, there is no attractive, um, strong interaction. So picture-wise, what do I imagine? 
what I imagine here, something like this. I imagine that I have a nuclei. Let's say that this is my nuclei. And so now I'm going to send in, and we're going to say here that this distance from here to here, we're going to call D, but it's greater than D critical. So if I send in a neutron, here's my neutron. And so I shoot this neutron here and it's going along this path. So what happens? It continues to move in a straight line. In other words, in this situation, it continues along a straight line. without any strong interaction. Now, if I do effectively the same thing, but now I'm going to send in a proton instead. So I have to modify my picture here. So now what I have here is I have my proton that's coming in. So if I look at my proton, here's what I see. I have my proton and so when I send this guy in there is a deflection so as it approaches here it gets repelled away so then the proton is moving in this direction like this. So what happens here? You get Coulomb repulsion causes a deflection, a repulsive deflection. And that's not a surprise, right? That is not a surprise. However, a nucleon just passing Um, the critical distance does feel a strong attractive interaction. And it gets deflected towards the nucleus. So if I take my system here and I bring it down here, this is what happens. So now what we're doing is that we're taking where D here is now approximately equal a little bit bigger than D critical. And so what happens now is that you get a deflection that now moves this neutron in a downward. And if I do the exact same thing for, with the proton, here, let me just do this.
So if I replace this with the proton here, remember in the previous situation, we would have expected a um, repulsion, but now look what's happening. We are seeing that there is a clear um, strong attraction. So here in both situations, you get a strong attraction causes a downward deflection. Now we're finally seeing the behavior of the strong attraction. Now, if this is too hard of a picture to actually draw here, so I'll just say it in words, if a nucleon comes within D critical, it will be captured and made part of the nucleus. That is, it is now bound inside the nucleus. Once again, it's more complicated. than this. You know, a lot, a lot happens. Our job here is not to get into those details. Our job here is to try to understand the basic details. So now let's go and do our next thing here. So we want to go from forces to potential functions. And the reason why we're doing this is that now what we're really looking to do is that we want to have, we want to model interactions. We don't have a good way of doing this with forces. So the we said this already, but let's just very quickly say this again. The language of the language of forces is not a good how do I say this descriptor of interactions but Potential functions are. And we answered the question already, but here's again in a nutshell, why interactions is a more general term. 
than forces. Interactions include momentum and energy exchanges as well as other influences. Like, for example, so I would say that, um, how do I write this? If you look at, let's look at something like this. We're going to see this here very, very, very quickly. When you get inside the nucleus, there are multiple things that are occurring. One of the things that we have to include is something called intrinsic spin. Intrinsic spin can greatly affect interactions, but intrinsic spin is not a force of nature. It's a behavior of particles. That's why we can't write that as a force. We write that as a potential because it affects angular momentum of the system. So I'm going to take away this Y here because we've discussed this already here. But here's what we really want to talk about. The potential function is a a topo map or to topographical parameter that gives a visualization of what an interaction does. But it's abstract. And what you find here is that this topo map will show the landscape, just like a regular topo map, the landscape features in repulsive and attractive interactions. And what it's going to lead to, it's going to give us a very good model for how electrons get bound to a nuclei. It creates what we call a potential well. So let's get to that. So now, as an analogy, I want to bring up what's called the spring potential well. So I want to revisit. So let's revisit the mass spring system that you learned about in mechanics. So here, what this really tells us is it says this, that the origin of the spring force is viewed as the derivative of the spring potential. Now there's two ways to view this here. So there 
are two ways to visualize the behavior of a mass spring system. One is what I call the physical picture. And the physical picture, there's the physical picture. And in the physical picture, this is what humans see. But now, I want to move away from that physical picture, and I want to talk about the energy picture. The energy picture is definitely in the abstract. It's not what we see, but it turns out to be a really good way to visualize this. So here's what we're looking at, okay? So if I talk about a physical picture, then I'm thinking something like this. So I imagine that we have a mass that's going to oscillate. And we could then point out different motions that are taking place. So what we'll see here is that if I look at a physical picture, we could imagine that we set up a mass spring system. So in this picture, we have a system that looks like this here. So uh, I don't know how big to draw this. So let's say that right here is gonna be my cart. And Let's say that it looks like this. Now I wanna to try to make this symmetric. And so what you're seeing here is, I imagine that I'm hooking up a two spring system. And the only reason why I'm doing this is just to get rid of gravity. And what you're gonna find here is that at this location here, this is the equilibrium. Now, there's a couple of things that we should think about. We will never find the cart in this location right here. This here is what we will call the forbidden region. A cart can never be past the walls here. So now what we're going to do is that we're going to displace the cart. So now we're going to displace the So if I displace the cart, then I'm going to come in and I'm just going to copy this. And so as this thing moves back and forth here, here's what I'm going to see. Let me see if I have enough space to put in again. If not, I have to adjust things. Oh, I think I have enough space. So what I imagined here is that I'm not at equilibrium anymore. And this thing is going to move past the equilibrium point. So if I look at this guy, I'm gonna, I, I wanna keep my cart here. I'm gonna erase this and I'm gonna imagine that this cart now is past the equilibrium. So if I take my cart and I move it to right here, 
you could see that it's past the equilibrium point. So in other words, the spring on the left is very stretched out. This guy is not stretched out at all. And so when I look at this behavior, you know what? I think I'm going to copy this again. I think this is more useful here. So I'm going to copy this. And so what I want to do here is that I want to set up two situations. The first situation is that if the cart is moving in this direction, then the spring force is going to move and it's going to be in that direction. So what I'm seeing here that it's moving right past the equilibrium point. So in this case, we clearly see deceleration. Now, in this situation, what I'm going to say is that this gets all the way to its turning point. But the spring force here is still in this direction. And so what I'm seeing here is that now that the cart reaches the turning point. which that implies that the spring force is max and it stopped. So in, in other words, it's reached its amplitude. Now I want to replace the same type of picture here with the abstract. So as I said before, in the abstract energy space, one plots the potential energy of the spring, and it's the spring that creates the topo. So let's go here. So this now is then going to be the potential. Oops, spelled that wrong. So when I look at this thing here, what I see is that I have a system that looks exactly like the physical picture right here. But in the potential picture, what I have here is that I plot the potential energy. So if I look at the potential energy of the spring, you can see that it's quadratic in X. So if I look at this, I can see here is that there's this edge right here, and then there's another edge right here. So what I have to do is that I need to draw a potential well. So then I'm going to come here, and I'm going to try to draw this so that it comes here. And then this is going to come all the way down to here. Now, it should be symmetric, but it's not. So what do I mean by this forbidden region? So if I look here, this dark here tells me that that's the forbidden region. That means no object, no cart can be in that space. So once again, right in here, this is the forbidden region. So where is the equilibrium point? Well, the equilibrium point is the exact same as before. So when I look at my cart, right, if I take my cart and if I'm able to copy it, let me see if I can grab this.
app. I'll just redraw it. So if I look at my cart, my cart here is at the bottom of the potential well, as we would say this. At this point, we see that the spring force here is equal to zero. And what we have plotted here is that this line right here, we have plotted u of s, which is one half kx squared. So you could see the quadratic behavior. And so this here is our equilibrium point. So now I want to do the exact same thing here. So now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to imagine that this cart is now displaced. So if it's displaced, I can then come in and I imagine that I have this scenario. The cart is not in equilibrium, but what it's doing is that it's moving. So as it moves, I can have this situation. So I'm going to erase this since we already know. So I have effectively the same picture that I have before. So when I'm looking at this, look what happens. As the cart is moving past, right, moving past the equilibrium, I'm seeing my velocity going in this direction, but clearly there is some type of force that's going here. And the way we get that force here is that, again, we can calculate the spring force by taking the derivative of the potential function. And so when we do that, we then re get, we reclaim this. But now let's start changing our language. This, as the cart is moving up the incline, we're going to call this repulsive behavior. Why? Because it's slowing it down. On the other hand, if I have this cart, and it's moving in this direction now. Note that the spring force or the slope of this thing, you can see here is that it's attracting it towards the equilibrium. So we're going to call this attractive behavior. So what I'm saying here is that we can talk about these behaviors two different ways. There's the physical picture. There's this abstract way of visualizing what is happening in energy space. So a key point of the spring potential well is that it traps the cart inside. In other words, it's a bound system. It's a bound system similar to how an electron is bound to the nucleus. How a nucleon is bound to the nucleus. 
one can physically be observe the behavior now in a more abstract space that makes more physical sense. And even though I keep saying energy space, let's give you just a very simple analogy. So if we're using conservation of mechanical energy, we can imagine that we have a block going down an incline. So imagine that I have an incline, and it looks like this. So if I have this incline, one of the things that you got to think about this incline, now remember, this is, this is the physical picture that I'm going to draw. And what you're finding here is that I can have a block. I can take a block here. And then I could imagine that I'm going to go through incremental steps here. And I'll try to space these out evenly, more or less. And what we would expect as this block is coming down the incline, that it is going to increase in speed as it goes down. So for example here, if I look at this, I'm gonna say that this speed is zero, and then this guy's gonna be moving faster and faster, and it moves the fastest at the bottom here. So when we look at conservation of energy, we could map this different. And what we say here is that if this is my, my total energy of the system, we know that E mechanical must equal to a constant, which means that the combination of these two always has to be the same. So if I start to visualize what's going on, you could see that at state one, it's all potential energy. So the total energy is all in the potential. But as this thing goes down, you're seeing that there's a reduction in potential as we move down. So if I'm looking at this as a way of tracking energy, I'm seeing this picture. But now if I look at the kinetic energy, we see that the kinetic energy is being transferred from potential all the way to kinetic energy here. And so even though visually we say, of course, that thing has to speed up, this is showing us that by looking at the potential function, and believe it or not, this is the gravitational potential. So when I look at the gravitational potential function, it's going to be minus mgy, where here I am plotting y. And you can see that it's negative. It's proportional to negative y, so that's a negative slope line. This following energy picture clearly describes the motion of the block. So now let's start to get into the physics that, we, that we're here to do. So physics models complex situations using potentials. Instead of the physical picture.
it's just plain easier. That's why. The physical picture gets extremely challenging in trying to understand what is going on. The potential picture will make it way more powerful for us. So let's look at that. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to talk about potential wells. So what do we mean by potential wells? When particles are a bound or particles are part of a bound system Potential wells allow us to use energy concepts to interpret the physics. Not Forces. In atoms, there are two bound systems similar to the spring mass system. So one of them is the, the positive nucleus binds the negative electrons inside the atom. And in a similar picture, we find that the nucleus binds nucleons inside the nucleus. So there are two bound systems. So the question is, what do these pictures look like, right? So what we're seeing here is that potential wells trap particles. So then the question really tells us what do these look like? So they have to be different because they're different interactions. So let's talk about trapping electrons inside atoms. So here we have this electrical attraction, okay? So the electrical attraction of the nucleus creates a potential well
or the electron. So what do I mean by that? Imagine that I have a nucleus. This is my nucleus right here. And I need to represent this nucleus with something electrical. So then we say here that if I was to draw a picture of the nucleus, we call this the electrical potential. So when I draw this out, it actually looks like this. So a model for drawing this electrical potential looks like this. So I represent the nucleus like that. So now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to say, so how do I create an atom? So what's a really good picture for the atom? And all we know is that we have this. So then I take the exact same picture. And then what I'm going to do here is that now I'm going to do this differently. So now we don't call it the potential. We then say that this is the potential energy. And so when I look at this, remember this right here is again the forbidden region. And so where's my electron? My electron is trapped inside of you. So that means the electron can move back and forth at this energy level. And what you're seeing here is that this right here is our bond bound or trapped electron in the atom. So to me, this is a very strong picture of the atom. And so what you're seeing here is that the nucleus is trapping an electron inside the atom. That's what we mean by this. So this is a good picture of the atom. Now, I can say the same thing about nucleons. So now, if I start trapping nucleons, inside nuclei, I have to show some type of bound system. And this is what we know here. What we know here is that the strong attraction of the nucleons, excuse me, how did I say this? So instead of electrical attraction, what we're going to have here is that we're going to say that the strong attraction of the nucleus creates a potential well for the nucleons. So then picture-wise, how do we draw this? Now remember, this is the strong force. So my picture then effectively starts to look, it has to be different than the other one. So here's my nucleus. 
So what is the potential picture? It looks like this here. And what you're going to see is that it curves up like this, and then it goes like this. So once again, this here is the forbidden region. And this is what we call the strong potential. And by the way, look how it's different than this. And it's because it's a different interaction. So now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to do the exact same thing that I did before. And so when I look at this thing, I now move to not the potential picture, but the potential energy picture. So I'm going to come over here, and then I now replace this with, oops, with the potential energy picture. And what happens in the potential energy picture is that if I have a trapped nucleon, it's going to be doing this. And look how similar this picture is. So you're seeing here that this guy right here, again, is a bound slash trapped nucleon in the nucleus. So as we said before, the nucleus is trapping a nucleon inside the nucleus. So now we've dealt with potential wells and what we mean by a bound system. So then to end this discussion here, here's what we find. So now let's talk about the repulsive and attractive potential and our focus here is kind of it's going to be all about electrical right here so here's what we know Attractive electrical forces cause charges to speed up or slow down towards each other. And the reason why they do this here is that you could imagine the following thing here. So when I look at, so let's, let's say that this right here, how am I going to draw this? Let's say that we have this guy. Oops. I'm going to have a nucleus. And it's positively charged. So what I'm going to imagine here is that if I have an electron, this electron is going to do what? It's going to experience an electrical force in that direction. And because it's experiencing an electrical force, we know that its motion 
is going to be this way. So what this is telling us here is that in this situation, F electrical and velocity point in the same direction. And in energy language, this causes a change in the kinetic energy, which is positive. It's going to speed it up. On the other hand, I could have a repulsive electrical force or repulsive electrical forces cause charges to slow down, or they could cause them to speed up. But we need to look at both situations here. So when I say to slow down, as they approach each other. So now if I take the exact same situation, but now I replace the electron with a positive charge instead. So now I have a positive charge here. And so if I'm looking at this positive charge, what you're seeing here is that there's this repulsive electrical force while the object is moving in this direction. So in this situation, we then say that F electrical and velocity point in opposite directions. So that tells us in energy language that there's a reduction in kinetic energy. So if I look at the model, so the model, the potential model um, for electrical interactions can look two ways. One way that it could look like is that it could look something like this. So if I do it in, so I could say that this here is the electrical. You know what? I made a mistake. Let me redraw this again. I could then take the electrical aspect of this, and I can replace it with this curve right here. So if I plot this here, you're going to see that V electrical, which is positive, I got to be careful here. We can view it two different ways. One way that I can view it is that it looks like this here. So if it looks like this, again, this becomes the forbidden region. So what I'm really plotting here is that I'm plotting this here. So what we could imagine here is that there's two motions that can occur. So picture-wise, let's talk about the force picture. And then I'm going to look at the potential picture. And in the force picture, I'm going to imagine that I have my nucleus here. 
And what my nucleus does here is it creates an, an incline like this. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to copy this because it's going to describe this situation very similarly. So now, here we go. If I send a negative charge that has a velocity in this direction, it is going to experience an electrical force like this. And we can clearly see that in this situation, because they are in the same direction, the work done by the electrical force increases the kinetic energy. So the way we picture this is we say that this electron is on this hill. And so what is it doing? We can clearly see that it's going to speed up. So the potential here sets up an incline to increase kinetic energy. But now, if I do the reverse here, I'm going to set in a positive force, and that positive force is then going to be in the opposite direction. We clearly see that the kinetic energy change will be negative. In other words, it's telling us that it's slowing down. As a consequence, we then envision this guy as going upwards. It goes up the incline. And here we see that the potential sets up. an incline to decrease kinetic energy.